God, thank you so much for another morning, another day to be with your people, to open up your word together, to address one another with songs and hymns and spiritual songs, all of the things that happen on Sundays. God, you love uh, to sanctify your word through, or your people through your word, and so I pray that that would happen as well this morning, that you would be glorified to exalt yourself in the preaching of your word, and that the, uh, the members, the, the people who are here uh, at Grace Bible Church and who are hearing the teaching, that you would apply exactly what you want uh, to the lives of your people, that we would have uh, increasing clarity and godliness and love uh, toward one another as a result of submitting to what you've said. And we pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Consider this question. What kind of person would kill God? Who would do such a thing? Who would seek to remove God from this world or cause God generally to cease to exist? What kind of depraved individual would engage in that kind of assassination attempt on the very life of God himself? Maybe even as you hear that question, specific people you know come to mind. Maybe your three-year-old or something. Uh, maybe you think of historical figures, people like Hitler or Pharaoh, who drowned infants in the Nile, or someone like Joseph Stalin comes to mind. Those wouldn't be unreasonable answers, perhaps, when answering the question, what kind of person, who would seek to kill God. But if those kinds of individuals who are notorious for terrible acts of brutality is all that comes to mind, then we would really be missing the heart behind this question, uh, how we should be thinking about a question like this. The answer to that question, who would kill God, is rather simple biblically, and it's, it's this. The one who would break God's law would take God's life. That's who. A sinner. Someone who would break God's law is the same kind of person who would also, if given the opportunity, take God's life. In 1 John chapter 3, John gives us a succinct, helpful definition of sin. 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. And he says this, Everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. It is a casting off of God's authority, a refusal to submit to God's word, God's law. God's own requirements, when met with resistance, is the very definition of sin. Now, when we refuse to be like God in the ways that God himself requires uh, in this continuing series on sanctification, we're talking about uh, sin over several lessons. In this week and last week, uh, we've, or we are talking about what I'm calling practical atheism. Uh, practical atheism. This is a term intending to describe someone who maybe not verbally maybe not overtly or willingly in that sense, but certainly in their actions, with their deeds, 
maybe at the thought level, there is a practical denial of God. So practical atheism. There are no real atheists. Everyone knows that God exists. God has put the knowledge of himself in us. So it's inescapable to acknowledge that God exists. But with our works, we can choose to not acknowledge him. We can choose to dishonor him in the things that we do say, how we respond to the revelation that God himself has made clear. This is Paul's own point in Romans chapter 1. If you just turn there for a second, we can see this in the New and Old Testament. This is why righteousness must come by faith apart from works and why Paul is unashamed of the gospel because of this problem with man. God's wrath, verse 18 in Romans 1, is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who do what? Suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. He's done that, according to verse 20, since the creation of the world. He's made his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they these men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness, which is all men, we are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. This is the problem with all men, even with men who are not bold enough to verbalize atheism, atheistic thoughts, who wouldn't dare to take up the arguments of an atheist against the existence of God, well, that's good. But still, practically, in the life, in the heart of man, there is this sinister evil that in every sin, behind every sinful thought, word, deed, etc., there is a lurking denial of who God has revealed himself to be. That is practical atheism. And that is what happens, in a nutshell, in every sin. Go to Psalm 14. In Psalm 14, you can see this same principle. Eric just preached this a few weeks ago during communion. And in this psalm, just see how closely a profession of atheism is tied with a practical denial of who God is, a disobedience and a casting off of God's authority. The psalm begins, for the choir director, a psalm of David, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. That's the claim at the heart level of the one identified by David as the fool. Someone worthy of that title, fool, says this in their heart. There is no God. They've determined to live life as if that's true knowing that it's not. Well, here's what else is true of them. They are corrupt. They have committed abominable deeds. There is no one who does good. If you thought that this was limited to the person who says this with their lips or who might earn the title of a fool because their life is disorderly to that extent, no, David says there is no one who does good. So the fruit of atheism 
is owned by all men. No one escapes that indictment. There is no one who does good. Yahweh has looked down from heaven upon the sons of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all, referring to these sons of men under heaven, they have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. And as you know, Paul repeats this same psalm in Romans chapter 3. So the same thing that was true in David's day is true in Paul's day, is true in our day. Wherever you see the fruit of a denial of God in the world, you can trace that back to the heart and that there is folly in the heart that says, in some way, to some degree, there is no God. That is practical atheism. So again, the one who would break God's law, sin, is the one who would take God's life, remove God from the world, would prefer him not to exist. Ralph Vining said, sin goes about to ungod God and is by some of the ancients called deicidium or God murder, God killing. I don't know what ancients he's referring to, but they got the right idea. Sin goes about to ungod God. And so this morning, what I want to help us do, because this, these are useful thoughts for the Christian, uh, for your own sanctification, for your own growth in godliness, as you further understand this principle, as you gain clarity on what's happening at the heart level, how this practical atheism is, even in your redeemed new nature, this is still dwelling in us, this tendency to think in this way. And so to understand this will help us grow in our hatred of sin, to make the connection between how we are denying God practically, even the same God who saved us, whom we love, and whom we desire to know, wherever there is a sin manifestation, we need to be able to trace that back to the atheism that continues lurking in us. And so here's a, a path for us this morning for this equipping hour. Practical atheism is evident in man's resistance to God's authority, which culminated in Christ's death on the cross. We're going to connect those things. Practical atheism is evident in man's resistance to God's authority, which eventually culminated, that resistance to God's authority culminated in Christ's death on a cross. So practical atheism, man's resistance to God's authority, all connected to Christ's death. Those are the things that we're going to connect uh, this morning. You can see that this principle is true just in the, the very logic of it. That whenever man is participating in some sinful activity, some sinful behavior or thought pattern, he is practically resisting God's authority. And it's that kind of thought, that kind of sin, that would also, without God's restraining grace, in the life, seek to remove God from the world. It would seek to take God's life if God made that possible, in other words. That's the connection that we want to make. This is logical just in the, uh, to think of the idea that resistance to God's authority is this kind of practical atheism. Just by virtue of the fact that no two monarchs can rule simultaneously. 
Where, where does that happen? Equal authority given to two different individuals, and they simultaneously and harmoniously rule over the same individuals in that kingdom. It does not happen. You have illustrations of this in Scripture itself. Take, for example, when David was made king initially at the beginning of 2 Samuel. And if you remember, there's a period of time when David is not actually seated on the throne over the entire nation because the kingdom remains unyielded in its entirely in its entirety to King David. He's been anointed king, he's been promised the kingdom by God. But we read in chapter 3 of 2 Samuel that still verse 1 there was a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David. And David grew steadily stronger but the house of Saul grew weaker continually. So David and this descendant of Saul, Ishbosheth, have this ongoing feud, and this is how God saw fit to establish David's throne, but it took time. These two monarchs do not have equal authority over the same group of people. There has to be war between them. I suppose the, the only time that this has been true would be within the nature of God himself and the Trinity, equally regal, equally worthy of worship and all authority and kingship. And because they don't have a divided will, although they are distinct persons, the Father, Son, and Spirit, because they are one God and they have a perfectly united will, they rule equally worthy of the devotion of all of creation in perfect peace. That's the exception to this principle uh, that we find in God himself. But then all throughout Israel's history, you see what? Not kings ruling simultaneously. The nation splits. Benjamin and Judah go to the line of David, and the rest of the ten tribes belong to Israel. And one after another, a king has to be assassinated before the other ruler can come and take the throne. So because no two kings can rule simultaneously, then establishing a new authority requires the overthrow of the current authority. Anywhere where a new authority is going to be established, whoever's currently reigning has to be removed. And practically, you see example after example, it's the life of the current ruler that's taken so that the new one, the new ruler, can come and take his position. You can read 1 Kings uh, 16, where Omri takes the throne from Zimri. He established the nation in a bad way. And so just this, you know, if you follow the logic of this, no two kings can rule simultaneously. Establishing a new authority requires the overthrow of the current one. Just think about how practically that has to happen when sin, the sin even in us, is seeking to establish some authority other than God. In a heart, at a heart level, when you know what God has said, but we insist on doing something else, instead of submitting to God, I'm going to submit to some fleshly appetite that I have. What's happening in that moment? I am denouncing the authority of God and seeking to establish something else as a rule or a standard by which to live. I'm seeking satisfaction in this other rule. Jesus articulates the logic of this in Matthew 6 when he says, verse 24 of Matthew 6, no one can serve two masters. 
No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. In order to serve God, you have to denounce wealth as a pursuit ultimately in your life. You have to make that not something worthy of pursuing in order to accurately, faithfully worship God. Now, the specific issue on the table uh, in, at this point in the Sermon on the Mount is possessions. And so Jesus has specifically possessions in view, but the principle that no one can serve two masters is generally true. You could fill in the blank that wealth takes here with anything else. You cannot serve God and marriage. You cannot serve God and comfort. You cannot serve God and man. Or anything else you can put in the blank and, and God. No one can serve two masters. In the moment when you are serving, just practically serving something else, then you have, at a heart level, removed God from the throne and put something else there as worthy of living for. That thought, um, our ability to fight sin, requires us to make the connection between that thought and whatever else we're worshiping other than God. Sin is not bad because it inconveniences us, because it harms others ultimately. Just as we talked about last week, sin is bad. Sin is sinful because it's contrary to God himself. So if we don't make the connection with how our sin offends God, with how in a moment of sin we are rejecting and refusing the authority of God then it's no wonder that we don't hate it more, that we don't confess sin better. We have to make the connection. So practical atheism is demonstrated or seen in resistance to God's authority that we exchange God's authority for other things. That's the logic of this. Also, there's an illustration, not only the logic, but we should look at, number two, the illustration of this principle. Go to Matthew chapter 21. We'll see this illustrated by Jesus himself as he resists the Pharisees, sort of like a, a last hoorah a last showdown between Christ and the Pharisees. Now Jesus is in Jerusalem. He's showing up at the temple and teaching for his final days of his ministry. And if you wondered, if you were wondering, is resistance to God's authority, is the kind of practical atheism that's resident in resistance to God's authority, the kind of sin that would take God's life, then this passage actually connects those dots for us. The person who practices atheism, embraces practical atheism, when they resist God's authority, is the kind of person who would kill God if given the opportunity. Look at what Jesus says in Matthew 21. We'll start at verse 23. Matthew records, When he entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him while he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things, and who gave you this authority? It's important to understand here that this is not a sincere question. In this first scene, 
this opposition to Jesus' authority that we're seeing is indeed opposition to Jesus' authority. The question itself demonstrates opposition to Jesus' authority because it's not a sincere question. They come to Jesus and they're asking as those who are offended that he's just cleansed the temple versus earlier and allowed children to worship him, essentially, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. They're indignant and they are requiring Jesus to tell them by what authority he's doing these things, cleansing the temple, receiving worship. What's your authority for that? Whenever man requires God to answer to him, there is idolatry happening. That's that's what's being pictured here. Jesus, you need to explain yourself to us. Outside of all of the evidence to your authority that has already been presented by you on your own terms, you need to answer to us now and and tell us by what authority you're doing these things. That is idolatry. That is practical atheism. We do this, require God to answer to us before we obey him, right? I'm sure you can think of examples in your own life in perhaps counseling situations that you've been a part of. Um, the, The child who's given a simple instruction by their parent, go put on your shoes, it's time to go. How come, time out, simple instruction, you have one job. Oh, children, obey your parents. Go put on your shoes. The question isn't a sincere question. It's delayed obedience. Uh, The husband who insists, before I love my wife like Christ loved the church, how do I know she's going to respond favorably and not try and walk walk all over my leadership? before I serve her in in these obvious, necessary, reasonable ways. Or the wife who says, I know I'm supposed to win my husband without a word, but I feel like if I do that, then he's going to treat me like a doormat. God, before I try and win him without a word, how do I know it's going to work out in my favor? That's what this is. That kind of practical atheism that requires God to answer to me is a resistance to God's authority. And just as a reminder, the question, the reason the question isn't sincere is because it's already been answered numerous times. If you just go back to the Sermon on the Mount again, chapters 5, 6, and 7 record the Sermon on the Mount. And at the end of Jesus' teaching, it's clear to everybody who heard this where the authority lies. Verse 28, when Jesus had finished these words, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one having authority and not as their scribes. So his teaching differed radically from the scribes' teaching because at this very point, at the point of authority, he is teaching as one who has authority. They did not teach this way. So they are already aware at the beginning of Jesus' ministry of his authority. This is the authority coming forth from his actual teaching. He's not only demonstrated authority in his teaching, but he's also demonstrated authority over sickness and illness. Verse 5 of the next chapter, when Jesus entered Capernaum, a, a centurion came to him imploring him and saying, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, fearfully tormented. 
Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. But the centurion said, Lord, notice how he's addressing him as Lord. He says, I am not worthy for you to come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go and he goes and to another come and he comes and to my slave do this and he does it. This centurion gets authority. He tells people what to do all the time with a word. Go, come, do this, and things happen when he speaks. So what is the implication that this centurion gets is, Jesus, I'm not worthy for you to cross over into the threshold of my home. So would you just leverage the authority that you possess and tell the sickness to go away? That's sufficient. What does Jesus call that? That kind of response to his authority, Matthew tells us, when, verse 10, when Jesus heard this, he marveled. You want to know what impresses God? That kind of faith. And he said this to those who were following, truly I say to you, I have not found such great faith with anyone in Israel. Among the chosen people of God, here is this Gentile demonstrating the essence of faith, and Jesus calls it great faith, to a recognition and acknowledgement of Jesus as Lord and the authority inherent in his person, Jesus calls great faith. This is what couldn't be found in Israel. In Israel, there was atheism. Among many Gentiles, there's faith, there's belief. And that is even understanding that contrast, that distinction, that practical atheism is a demonstration of unbelief. So the converse of that is faith. To put off practical atheism, you must put on faith. That is, that principle is tremendously helpful to us in our sanctification. As you pursue the Lord, as you pursue humility, as you pursue righteousness, the way you do that is by putting off unbelief and believing God. That means you have to know what truth to to lay hold of so that you can believe at the heart level. Wherever you see, you see sin, you say, oh, that's unbelief. That's my practical atheism at work. What is it that I'm not believing in this moment? There's a host of things true about God. There's a host of things true about eternity. There's a host of things true about me. There's a host of things true about the people I'm sinning against and salvation and life and fill in the blank. I'm not believing any of those things that are true in this moment, and that is why I'm practically sinning. We have to be able to identify that in order to put on the faith that would produce obedience. So in this illustration of practical atheism that would kill God, it's first manifested verse 23, back again in Matthew 21, in opposition to Jesus' authority. Jesus knows that this is what's happening, and so he unmasks the Jews' hypocrisy. While they oppose Jesus' authority, he is unmasking their hypocrisy. And he does that initially in verse 24, with a simple question. Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one thing, which, if you tell me, I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. See, he's not willing to submit to their terms. 
they ask him a question, they require God in human form to submit to them, God will never do it. He will never cater to the unbelief of the unbeliever. The only way an unbeliever can come to God is on his terms, which is why one must confess Jesus as Lord. Risen from the dead and reigning, you must acknowledge Jesus as Lord. This is the door through which all unbelief must come, leave the unbelief at the door, not require God to submit to it on its own terms, and accept God on his own terms in an act of submission and faith. So he wisely puts the question back to them. He says, uh, verse 25 says, the baptism of John was from what source? From heaven or from men? I'm willing to tell you where I get my authority if you tell me first where John got his. Because he knows how they've already responded to John. You can read about that in Matthew 11. The issue was never the messenger. The issue was always the message. John being the most recent example prior to Jesus of that reality. They've been rejecting God's message, so it doesn't matter by whom the message comes. They hate that messenger because he's still bringing the same message of submission to God's authority. They respond, verse 25 still, they begin reasoning among themselves saying, if we say from heaven, he will say to us, then why did you not believe him? We can't really say from heaven. Verse 26, but if we say from men, we fear the people. For they all regard John as a prophet. So, we can't say yes, because then we're trapped. We can't say no, because then we're trapped again, because we fear man. The fear of man lays a snare, Proverbs says. So what do they say? Answering Jesus, they said, like so many children who don't want to give a straight answer? I don't know. We don't know. It doesn't absolve them of responsibility because Jesus' response says, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things then. And then he goes on. He further unmasks the Jews' hypocrisy with a parable indicating or indicting, rather, their unbelief. He unmasked their hypocrisy further, not only with a question revealing their idolatry, but with a parable indicting their unbelief. Here's the first parable. What do you think? A man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in the vineyard. And he answered, I will not. But afterward, he regretted it, and he went. The man came to the second son and said, the same thing. And he answered, I will, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said, the first. Now, how come they answered this question, but not the previous question? The previous question was making it real clear that they did not regard the authority of God. This question they seem comfortable answering right away. Oh, easy, the first one. Even in the next parable that he's going to tell, they respond and they answer. They're not afraid to answer Jesus. Why? Well, because up until this point, they don't see the indictment. They don't see the wisdom behind the parable. That's an interesting indication in the story that Wherever man doesn't think he has to submit to the will of God, he's willing to play along. Once it's clear that God's authority requires their submission, even in the questions asked, I'm unwilling. That's what's happening here. Jesus said to them, verse 31, Truly I say to you that the tax collectors and prostitutes 
will get into the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and prostitutes did believe him. That's Matthew and his friends he's writing about who came to Jesus. But the tax collectors and prostitutes did believe him, and you, seeing this, did not even feel remorse afterwards so as to believe him. You weren't like the first son in this first parable who felt remorse at resisting the authority of God and then went to obey him. You didn't even do that. So he unmasked the Jews' hypocrisy with a parable indicting their unbelief. Notice how Jesus doesn't call it obedience. Isn't that interesting? He doesn't say in verse 32, for John came to you in the way of righteousness and you did not obey him, but the tax collectors and prostitutes did obey him. And you seeing this did not even feel remorse afterwards so as to obey him. He's emphasizing, I mean, that's true, but he's emphasizing faith. You didn't believe. And in the parable, he describes it as obedience. Because he heard the will, uh, the will of his father, said he wouldn't, regretted it, and he went and actually did what his father told him to do. He obeyed the father. So belief or uh, faith is behind every act of obedience, true obedience. Obedience from the heart requires faith. The third and final way that we'll discuss that he unmasked the Jews' hypocrisy was thirdly with a parable recounting their practice. With a question revealing their idolatry, with a parable indicting their unbelief, and then with a parable recounting their practice. This, with this story, Jesus is going to capture the gist of what's been happening all throughout the Old Testament, all the way up until his day. Even a little bit uh, in, in some days past Jesus' own, own time when he's telling this story. He goes even a little bit into the future, as we'll see. Verse 33, listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard and put a wall around it and dug a wine press in it and built a tower and rented it out to vine growers and went on a journey. When the harvest time approached, he sent his slaves to the vine growers to receive his produce. That is a picture of what God did in the Old Testament. He planted Israel, secured them in the land, and gives them stewardship of the very land that he gave them. Gives them his law. He sets them up to be fruitful in the land. You'll notice that if you read through the, the Torah, the law, Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, they get laws all closely attached to when you get in there, do, do this, live this way. The law was attached in the Old Testament to the land. And so he has perfectly prepared them to go into the land and be fruitful in this land flowing with milk and honey. And their obedience, not ironically, was attached to the fruitfulness of the land. As long as you obey Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 28, the land's going to be plentiful. You won't have miscarriages. Your animals won't miscarry. You, you will be the head, not the tail. People will owe you. You won't owe anybody. Abundant crops. In the season, it's going to rain like it's supposed to, and stuff is going to grow supernaturally in ways that seem more like Eden than life in a fallen world. If you just obey God and believe him and follow his law, that's the way it's going to happen. So they were perfectly established in the law, just like Jesus tells the story. When harvest time comes and the slaves would have been the prophets of God coming to receive the fruit of God's own establishing of the nation, 
This is what took place, verse 35. The vine growers took his slaves and beat one and killed another and stoned a third. Again, he sent another group of slaves larger than the first, and they did the same thing to them. But afterward, he sent his son to them, saying, they will respect my son. But when the vine growers saw the son, they said among themselves, now he's describing this backroom plot, which is exactly what happens. This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. They took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine growers? They said to him, he will bring those wretches to a wretched end and will rent out the vineyard to other vine growers who will pay him the proceeds of the proper, at the proper season. They are so dull and slow to understand, they don't even realize the way that they're indicting themselves. Because verse 45 says, when the chief priests and Pharisees heard th- his parables, they understood that he was speaking about them. Well, good job. You get, you're getting your understanding. You're starting to understand the clarity of what Jesus has been saying. Notice that the unbelief and the hypocrisy that was characterizing these scribes and Pharisees this Jewish leadership, in the very parable, did what to the servants or slaves of God? Killed them. And when God himself, in the person of his son, came, in the parable, what do those same unbelieving, practical atheists do with God himself, the son? Kill him. All unbelief trends this way. All unbelief trends this way. Without God's restraining grace at work in man, without his saving work, his saving grace at work in the believer, with all restraints off, this would be the goal of every single sin we have ever committed. It would result in, if we were able, the death of God himself. If we could step into heaven, we would assail the throne, is the idea. That initial question that I posed, who would practice, uh, who would kill God, who would participate in the murder of God, we don't have to wonder because what Jesus describes actually does happen. We have gotten a glimpse of this already. It's unbelievers would participate in murdering God. Hypocrites would participate in murdering God. Unbelief and hypocrisy aim at the removal of God from the world, the removal of God from his throne. If you just surveyed Mark 14, and this would be a a useful exercise for you. Read through Mark chapter 14, because in Mark 14, what's so helpful about that passage, it's long, 72 verses long, and it gives us a thorough description of the plot against Jesus all the way up through in uh, 14, Peter's denial of Jesus when he's uh, on trial. So it takes us through a good chunk of Jesus' last hours. And just mark what sins are present in chapter 14 of the Gospel of Mark. What sins are present here and what sins contribute in some way to the eventual crucifixion of Christ? And that 
will give you the answer to your question, what kind of person would participate in the murder of God? Let me just give you a list of what you'll find if you were to go read Mark 14 on your own. Who would participate in the murder of God? Well, the easiest answer to that is murderers. Murderers would participate in the murder of God. Mark 14, 1 says, Now the Passover and unleavened bread were two days away, and the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to seize him by stealth and kill him. They are murderers, and they are seeking to do that very thing, kill God in the person of his son. Who else would kill God? Schemers. People who plan to do evil. That's exactly what's going on in the same verse. They're seeking to seize him by stealth, not openly, by stealth, under cover of darkness, and do what they are too cowardly to do during the day. Murderers would murder God. Schemers would kill God. Also, man-fearers would kill God. Verse 2, for they were saying, not during the festival, otherwise there might be a riot of the people. So they fear man, even as we saw in Matthew 21. So people who are idolaters, who worship man, whose primary concern is life is what people think of them, man-fearers would also participate in the murder of God, as well as greedy men, those who are greedy. Verse 4, but some were indignantly remarking when they saw this woman pouring costly perfume on Jesus' head. They were remarking to one another, why has this perfume been wasted? For this perfume might have been sold for over 300 denarii and the money given to the poor. And they were scolding her. What's, what's going on there? They're not actually concerned with the poor because we read uh, in, in John's gospel even that Judas was the one primarily making that claim. Man, we could have given money to the poor, but it was only because he held the money box and he used to take what was in it. Have you ever sinned in, in these ways? Maybe you're thinking, not murder. Jesus says, whoever hates his brother in his heart is a murderer. Or uh, John, rather, in 1 John 3.15. So by God's standards, hating someone is equivalent to murder. Has the same heart as a murderer. Have you ever been guilty of hating someone? Have you ever planned to do evil? Been a schemer? Have you ever worshipped people's opinion of you and valued what they think of you more than what God thinks? Have you ever been, have you ever feared man? Or been greedy? Then that's indication that in those moments when we've practiced those sins, we've had the same heart as someone who would kill God, as these, as these men who do actually go on to kill God. Just run through this, the rest of this list. Disloyal friends like Judas and the disciples and Peter who all forsook Jesus are the kinds of people who would murder God. Those who rejoice over evil would murder God. When Judas came to the Leadership, it says they were glad when they heard what Judas said about betraying Jesus. So they're rejoicing in evil. Have you ever rejoiced in evil? Religious people who depend on religious duties to establish their own righteousness before God. Even that's happening in Mark 14 as they are careful to carry out religious duties while they violate the law, they take comfort in the fact that they adhere to other parts. 
religious people, people who establish their own self-righteousness, would murder God. The self-confident, like Peter and the other disciples, who are confident in the flesh that they won't betray Jesus. The ones who rely on their own wisdom over against God's wisdom. You ever done that? All the time, right? Right in our own eyes. People who are proud. Disciples who are prayerless. Like we see happening with the disciples who refuse to stay awake long enough to pray with Jesus in his dying hours. Violent men like the mob and Peter and the people at the trial and the guards who just take pleasure in doing harm to Christ. Cowards would murder God. The disciples are cowardly. They all run, a- run away. Liars would murder God. You see consistent deceit throughout the trial of Christ. False witnesses, the high priests using trumped up charges. Also, as we've seen, hypocrites. You see hypocrisy at work here. Fault finders. False witnesses, the high priest, again, just those finding fault where there is none. And mockers, those who would scoff at God himself, at his humility to even go to the cross, that's on display. This is not only where this list of sins, but where every sin aims. What a helpful way to think about sin to grow in our hatred of it. Too often, we see the destructive effects of sin in our own life and in the lives of others, and that becomes the primary motivator for why we should hate sin. We're most excited for heaven because of inconveniences to us. Even that itself is proof of practical atheism that we don't think of God highly enough that when we're offended, we're first offended for God. (laughs) To labor, to root out remaining practical atheism is obviously a lifelong pursuit. Just think, in closing, think about how you never had these thoughts before Christ. You were never bothered that you offended God you, you never cared that these sins took aim at his glory. That you didn't believe him and would offend him so that you could worship your own pleasures. The fact that that happens now is cause for rejoicing. And the more we understand that, the more we understand how even our lingering sin offends God in these ways, we will have even more cause to rejoice in Christ, to be thankful for the gospel, because God tells us the one who is forgiven much loves much. So discover just how much you have been forgiven so that you grow in your love for God as you put off sin. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word to reveal these things to us, to rescue us from ourselves, from resident unbelief. We were hopeless without hope and help in the world before Christ. If there are any here who still deny you by their lives, who may profess you with their lips, but practically deny you As a pattern of life, I pray that there would be salvation today, that there would be repentance, that you would be kind to give a new heart, a new hatred of sin never known before, and that those of us who know you would be ready with the gospel on our lips, eager to make known the message of reconciliation as your own ambassadors, slaves who get to proclaim Christ and reconcile sinners to you. Make us eager for this, God, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.